It is technically 3.15. Okay, Avinash, let's get started. Excellent, excellent. So, tell us, Mr. Oh, uh, ONC, <laughs> why do you care about public-private partnerships? Yes, Say ASDP. I mean, you know, repeat the question. See, Shafiq was heckling yes. you on, on, at the start. Exactly. Why does ASTP care about public-private partnerships to advance fire? Let's right, get started. Right, 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 right. So he starts with a, uh, with a tough question. So, so, you know, again, just introducing myself, I'm Inash Shanbhag. I serve in uh, Assistant Secretary for Technology Policy, also ONC. And really, public-private partnerships are important because at the end of the day, if we, regula we are regulators of, of health information technology, and at the end of the day, if it needs to work, it needs the market participation. And, and in order for us to ensure that standards are built so that they can be implemented, we need all of you. Without all of you participating in building standards, testing standards, and telling us where standards don't work or work well, or they need to be in a way that will help people use it, we really can't do our job. So we need you. Excellent right. set, okay. With that, here's how we're going to have fun. We're going to open up with news and then close with updates. So uh, to start the conversation today, CMS made news this morning on the National Directory for Health. And uh, joining us is Alex Muggy. Now, we don't have the fancy technology to put her on the screen. So say hi to Alex, uh, everybody. <laughs> Alex is here. Uh, she's going to join us. Um, before we get into the, let me give the agenda. Then. Poor Alex, I don't know if you can see everybody, we seem to do our best. Uh, then we're gonna, uh, Catherine is gonna be walking over from the other side of the building. So when Catherine gets here, we'll have our Cancer Moonshot group. Uh, then we'll talk about what uh, Undersecretary Sharif El Nahal announced earlier today about what actually is happening on the ground with the interoperability pledge. And then we'll ed end with updates on what's happening in the Sync for Social Needs Coalition. And last but not least, our rock star team at CMS for open source work. So. With that in mind, uh, Avinash and I are going to be going back and forth. I'll start with Alex. Alex Muggy leads much of the work to write the uh, interoperability rules and, uh, technically speaking, operates within the Office of Burden Reduction. Uh, Alex, you want to just say a quick hello to the group? Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, nice to see you through uh, Anisha's phone here. Hopefully, you can hear me pretty well out there. I can honestly say this is my first time giving a presentation through someone's phone. We love it. Everybody hears you just fine. Okay, great. Good. And the room okay, is full. So it's brimming with people. It's overflowing. You can't even see the horizon. <laughs> Sounds great. Uh, well, uh, Adish, you want me to just jump into the overview of what we're announcing today? Yes, please. Okay, great. Um, well, thanks everybody for joining. I, uh, I know that you're going to be hearing uh, about a bunch of incredible ways to gather information and all the things that are going on. Um, but I wanted to start off with an announcement about uh, well, what CMS is announcing today. We're actually announcing this in about uh, 12 minutes, so you're getting a little bit of a sneak preview. Um, and this relates to the National Directory of Healthcare. Um, as many of you know, CMS is intimately familiar with the challenges of provider directory data. The healthcare industry is constantly struggling with ways to improve directory accuracy, and we have not been able to fully address it to date. Um, we have learned in our research that there are over 5,000 provider directories nationwide, and many of them have accuracy levels below 50%, which really renders that data completely unreliable. Um, there's a lot of opportunity in this space. Um, Anish is going to uh, talk about some of that later on in ways that we can look at this data in new ways, the ways that we can pull it together and do um, new types of analysis to try to improve that accuracy. Um, but CMS is also taking some of that work internally. Um, so a couple of years ago, uh, back in October of 22, we published a request for information seeking comment on what role CMS should play here um, and how we should uh, look at the potential of a future national directory. And um, we heard overwhelmingly that industry wants to see progress in this space and that CMS is uniquely positioned to make a difference and to make that uh, make that progress happen. So today, like I said, now in about 11 minutes, um, the CMS is announcing that we will be partnering with the state of Oklahoma on a first of its kind uh, directory pilot um, that's going to help uh, to inform the design of the feasibility of a uh, future national directory of healthcare. Um, so again, this is a pilot that will be taking place in one state, but we're going to be taking the lessons learned from this, as well as what we hear from industry folks, um, to really inform the feasibility um, and future work towards a national directory of healthcare that would be hosted at CMS. 
Um, as part of the pilot, we're going to be developing an automated, centralized, statewide directory working with the qualified health plans and the providers in the state of Oklahoma. Um, our goal will be to improve the data accuracy of uh, the directories in that state, the QHP directories and other data within that state. Um, it will also be to evaluate how we can lessen burden on providers and payers, lower administrative costs, and support interoperable data exchange, all through streamlined and improved data accuracy and uh, provider directory um, information, including digital endpoints. So um, this is going to be a significant effort. We're going to be doing a lot of data cleanup work. Um, we're going to be looking across data sets, pulling together data from different places, testing different alg algor algor algorithms. Wow. Um, Glad I'm not on a big screen. Um, but we'll be testing different algorithms and exploring what others are doing, including folks like you in this room today. So um, we're excited to hear about the work that's going on out there. We're excited to keep you up to date on what we are doing at CMS. And hopefully we can continue to move forward with this proof of concept and lead that into the future uh, development of a national directory of healthcare. So I am personally very excited about this. We've been working on directory data for a very long time. I believe it will improve um, not only patient and provider experience, but it will also improve interoperability in healthcare. So this is a really meaningful piece of work here at CMS. And we're, again, looking forward to keeping you updated on the progress. Yay. All right. Thank you so much, Alex. <laughs> Forgive the uh, awkwardness of the Zoom, but th there we are. Uh, this is big. Uh, it's an opportunity. I'm asking Kathy Hempstead to join us next as because this issue has been near and dear to the Robert Johnson Foundation's heart. Kathy, would you share a word about what you've been doing to make directory rate up? No, come on up here. You've got to stand here. Um, yeah, just for, yeah. Hi, everybody. I was uh, very, very happy to hear that news, and we have been interested in improving the accuracy and availability of provider directory information in all different health insurance segments for a long time. I worked with Anish on it for many years. We worked on the schema.org project, which is still going. And we have paid a firm for a number of years now to make, uh, to make network data available for non-commercial use for marketplace, Medicaid, uh, Medicare Advantage, and um, researchers use it all the time, so to advocates, regulators, and, and journalists, but it, you know, we spend a lot of money making it available, and I'm really looking forward to the day when both the quality and the accuracy is improved a lot, and that the data are more available for, for use by everyone. And so I'm happy to hear this news, and look forward to further progress. You're I, not done yet. I am. You're not done yet. You're not done yet. You're not done yet. Kathy's been uh, helping underwrite access, but here's the news that she just shared. Uh, while we work on fire APIs for a lot of the healthcare data sharing use cases, physician directory information is often on the internet. And in the internet community, the data standardization uh, body is schema.org. I'm thrilled to announce, per Kathy's comments, that schema.org has updated how doctors can present their information on the internet such that all the information that uh, Alex and the CMS team is calling for for accuracy can be sourced directly from a physician's website. Up until now, the search engines viewed physicians as medical office locations. So that's now been updated to include NPIs. And hot off the press, I'm going to invite Gene to come up. What is this, Gene? Marshfield Clinic, first to adopt. Say a word or two. Okay, thank you. Um, so what I can really address here is Anish gave me a call on a Thursday and mentioned, hey, can you do this? And I, this isn't typically in my scope of work, so I called our digital marketing strategist and said, what is he talking about? Um, and she, on a Friday, August 30th, um, going into the weekend, the Labor Day weekend, she took the information, she worked with our um, group schema app to get it in place and get it marked up, and by Wednesday we were live. So I think that demonstrates just how fast you can get things done. Now, to Jean's credit, her digital team will tell you one of the advantages of doing this is that you get increased visits. And your visits are up 40 plus percent, not just on the, this version, but on the prior version. So more, more patients can see your information on the web. 
So it is in that spirit, I'm gonna ask you, Ben, now to talk about how do we pool all this data and make it available for the public. Ruben. Yeah. Hi, everyone. So yeah, my name is Yubin Park. Uh, so the, um, I'll actually kind of rewind the clock a little bit and yeah, to show you this uh, photo. So the, uh, there is uh, this, um, uh, I think, 10 years younger version of me. Uh, and yeah, I was here exactly 10 years ago, Health Data Palooza. So the, uh, it's uh, great to be back. Thanks a lot. <laughs> ten years. Ten years, yeah, and, uh, and I'm sorry that I haven't been coming for ten years. <laughs> so the, um, uh, or about the ten years, actually, kinda, it was a time that all the uh, publicly available data from the government started pouring out. Uh, thanks for Anish. So the, uh, and the, uh, that's kind of how I started my job. I uh, started uh, two startups in the past, and they sold them, and the, uh, a lot of my startup work was around the uh, publicly available healthcare data. Now, I'm uh, kind of on my third startup journey. And the, uh, this one, actually kind of what you see is, uh, who likes to download file from the internet? <laughs> I, I don't these days, especially kind of, there are a lot of different things going on around the internet. So the, uh, there are a lot of files out there, and especially there are a lot of uh, publicly available files out there. And the, uh, the things I've been uh, doing is, what if you can analyze the data without downloading a file? And the, uh, what I've been doing is collecting all these uh, publicly available data from different agencies, and the, also the private companies. I put it in the uh, high-performance data lake house and the, uh, let's open it up. Let's actually open it up to the uh, users out there, data analysts out there, and the, uh, let's have them write queries. So the, uh, that's kind of what I've been doing. The next slide. Oops. So the, uh, there are a lot of data out there uh, that the people do not even realize, and the uh, provider directory is uh, significant, and the, I'm very excited for the uh, national directory for health as well. Uh, but the, uh, there are a lot of uh, information out there, including uh, price transparency data, uh, and the, uh, a lot of uh, existing provider directory data as well, and the, all the work from the uh, data.cms.gov. Uh, thanks, for, uh, Andrea. So, <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> Alice. <laughs> so the, uh, all this information, now you can search in one place, and then you can combine them. And the, uh, I, I believe, actually, uh, when uh, this thing actually gets to the uh, creative minds out there, I think uh, we'll find a lot of new things there. So the, uh, this is kind of what I've been working on. I'm very excited to be here again. And the, uh, I'll actually hand off this to Ron. Yeah. So what we're going to do now is the data that's otherwise available is now aggregated. Ron's going to explain how we can use it to advance the principles of the National Directory for Health. Thanks, Anish. Thanks, Yubin. It's really exciting to hear about the National Directory Pilot. Looking forward to seeing more of that coming out. Uh, describing a little bit of what d we do at DeFacto Health, we integrate with payers' provider directory APIs. And we uh, integrate that data set, normalize it, unify it, and make it available for a number of different use cases. So on the right here, you see uh, provider search, plan comparison, provider referrals. Uh, payer network analytics, provider directory data cleansing. So we don't do all of that ourselves. We uh, partner with other companies and some of our customers to be able to bring those use cases to life across all of those different verticals. Uh, but we integrate with over 127 payers provider directory APIs. Uh, since the uh, um, effective date of the CMS final rule for interoperability and patient access. So that's been a long journey. Uh, those APIs didn't work right away when they first came out, and, uh, but eventually through um, uh, feedback and testing and giving results back to payers, uh, many of them have improved. There's still a long tail of payers that need to get there, and we will get there. In terms of use cases, I want to describe a little bit about a payer provider use case. So Alex mentioned before that uh, many payers' directories are uh, unfortunately not very accurate. Some of them are below 50% accurate. What I like to say is that payers' directories have errors, but they all have different errors. 
And when, where they agree and where they disagree is incredibly informative in terms of the accuracy of individual directory data records and then directories as a whole. And so we've created a consensus algorithm that brings together the 130 data sources and then predicts the accuracy of individual records and accuracy of directory data as a whole. And we've actually ranked payers uh, within a market according to their accuracy. Um, we'll be releasing some data on uh, payer accuracy rankings in the state of Oklahoma, by the way. Um, on the right here, we have uh, feedback to providers. We can show them how their roster differs or aligns with payers' directories. So this is supposed to catalyze a virtuous cycle of data quality improvement where providers know how their data is being represented inaccurately within payers' directories. Payers know how inaccurate their data is relative to their competitors, and then hopefully everybody improves. Um, let me just uh, drop one quick statistic. In the state of Oklahoma, 50% of directory errors across all payers are represented by 66 provider organizations. 25% of errors across payers' directories are represented by six very large provider organizations. You could get six people in a room to have a frank discussion about their directory data. There's a strategic opportunity if we can bring all these data sets together, compare them, to be able to really move the needle in a state, and hopefully that scales up across the nation. So let me talk about the patient use case. So this is uh, US News's website. They've got one of the most widely used doctor finders on the internet, and it's all the typical things. So you can search for providers by specialty, by location, by gender, by language, and now you can search for doctors by the insurances they accept. That is one of the top criteria that patients need to be able to select a provider is what insurance they accept. In addition to that, we've got very granular, useful information on the expertise, volume of services that they provide relative to their peers, which is also informative on provider selection. Thank you. All right, now, here we go. We are gonna make this train move. Avinash, it's time for cancer. My team here can move down, team cancer can come in, and the rock star, Dr. Catherine Young. While we do this, uh, Avinash, right. tell us why the president cares about the cancer great, moonshot. Great, great. Thank you very much. Uh, just a quick 30-second uh, uh, commercial on cancer moonshot. As you know, the Biden-Harris administration kick-started cancer moonshot 2022, and, and really they had two main goals. One was to reduce uh, deaths by half in 25 years, and also uh, relieve suffering uh, by cancer survivors and cancer patients. So again. Very near and dear to my heart, just because I used to, before I came to ASTP, also worked at the National Cancer Institute and was involved with a lot of their data interoperability requirements. So I'm super excited to have these folks here who are a combination of policies from our White House OSTP, Office of Science and Technology and Policy, and vendors and providers. So without further ado, let me invite the first speaker, Catherine Young. Thank All you very right. much. Thank you so much, uh, and, and my name is Catherine Young. I serve as the Assistant Director for Cancer Moonshot Policy and International Engagement, and I'm just thrilled to be able to be here. Thank you so much, Anish. Um, as many of you may know, in 2016, uh, back then, Vice President Biden actually issued a call to action here at this conference, emphasizing the urgent need for cancer data sharing. And when he spoke, his vision was actually really clear. It was to break down the silos that hold health data really captive and unleash the data to drive life-saving breakthroughs. And today, I'm really thrilled to be able to be here with all of you to see this vision come to light, especially with the earliest examples of Firebase data sharing. These efforts are tied to the EHR vendor commitments that were made at the White House just this past December, showing how the groundwork that was laid by then Vice President Biden, the cancer moonshot, and quite frankly, all of you sitting here today has really caused a pivotal moment, demonstrating that we can truly harness data to change lives. And while we recognize that many of the, today's programs are centered around value-based care, our vision and the vision of the president goes far beyond that. 
We envision data sharing that empowers every facet of cancer care, whether it's matching patients to relevant clinical trials more efficiently, whether that's contributing to large-scale research efforts or putting the power directly back into the hands of patients and their families. We want to imagine a future where patients can use their own data not just for second opinions, but to ensure that caregivers are are fully informed, creating a more personalized and compassionate care experience. Whether it's for clinical decisions or for guiding research, data must flow freely and responsibly to truly make a difference in the lives of cancer patients. And it's hard to believe that we have about 90 days left of this administration, so we call on everybody developers, innovators, healthcare leaders, to really seize this moment, to seize this movement. We need you to take action, whether that's developing more patient-centered tools, contributing to interoperability solutions, or advancing clinical trial matching technologies. The opportunities are endless, but the time is now. Let's ensure that the progress here that we've made is not just a fleeting moment, but truly a lasting legacy. Amen. Thank you so much. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. The first to listen to your call is going to be Shafiq. OK, please. Oh, sorry, Abhinash. Oh, no, Come no, on, no. Shafiq. I had, I had a little shout out. Yeah, Thank ahead. you, Catherine. <laughs> we are the victim of Anish. <laughs> uh, so he asked me to put up a slide about me. What we are saying is this, this is 2014, this is 2024. I didn't say 2023, it's 11 years. We have been working to make things work. Started from the fire, to making the blue button API, then do the DPC. I did all those, what do you call, demonstration. Uh, and to let people know that it is possible, the art of possibility. Some of my friends are in the, in the audience and I get excited about it. Of all the things that I was part of, my team did that, not me, but somehow we get a call from Anish and says, hey, dude, we got this new thing going on and can you do it by tomorrow? Uh, all right, uh, just go build an API. So can I have the next slide? Uh, I think uh, I will ask uh, my friend Nick Frenzer to tee it up. Hi everyone, I'm Nick Frenzer from Epic. Um, <clears throat> we support a number of the cancer and oncology centers in the US, and we have strived to support every different oncology model, every risk-bearing model that we can. One of the challenges with value-based care is when we create a new model, there's additional administrative work that's necessary. And part of our goal, and I would hope everyone in this room shares this goal, is let's not have to trade Excel files around anymore. So when we received the call to action from the White House, we evaluated it, and our team started development while I was on the plane. This is now available so that when we do documentation, we have a couple of screenshots uh, up. When, when we do documentation, we can then put that directly into a validation queue so I can see everybody that I am submitting, and that then you click one button and it sends up to CMS for that review. So that makes it fast, seamless, and prioritized so that people can submit this data. And we hope that this encourages participation in the enhancing oncology model, and most importantly, improves patient outcomes in the US and beyond. Thanks. And Nick, this is available yeah. to all Epic customers that are going to join EOM? Yes, this is available to any customer who is a participant of EOM. Woohoo! Oh, yeah! As of today. OK, so I'm the unlucky one. Uh, can you go back to the slide? Yep. Uh, on the top, uh, from the last, there is a something known as MSSP ACO button. That's actually an API button. So I'm not an EOM, but I do have MSSP, and I have thousands of patients who have cancer. So how do I get into the world of cancer? And how do I make things interoperable? So I'm going to drop a bomb in about two, I can't use that word, uh, pen. So I click on the MSSP. Now go to the next slide. It brings up a lookup for the patient who may or may not have cancer. Let's go to the next slide. By doing that, the, the API calls my internal ACO's site, 
where not only do I have the name of the patient, but look at TNM. When USCDI came, the TNM coding was not there. This is the first time we made tumor, nodes, and metastasis available through an API call. So as of today, anybody who has a EHR can transfer the data from one place to the other place with cancer data in it. I had 16 slides, but uh, Anish took them all out. Uh, next one, please. Oh, thank God it's not me. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, this is, I'm going to invite now Nick Stepero. Yes, he's going to tell us also what uh, the team's doing using this data. Yeah, cheers. P appreciate it. Thank thanks a lot, guys. Um, so um, what Shafiq just shared is uh, a application use case within Arcadia, and I just can't say enough. Arcadia, uh, we've been in this game for a long time, and we've spent so much so much heat loss just negotiating data exchange over the past 10, 15 years. And so every innovative idea, if you see all of these logos on the left, sits behind a really onerous data acquisition challenge of how the heck do we get the data uh, uh, in order to activate that and, and, and change care workflows. And um, the power of what Nick and his team at Epic have done and what Anish has been evangelizing and what uh, Sh Shafiq was able to do enabled us. And I'm glad, by the way, I'm not the only person that gets asked at the last minute to do something for Anish. That's like a theme of all of these presentations, which is great. Um, but that enabled us to turn around this use case where within you know a week or two, Two days, amazing, love this. Two days, we're able to extend our um, summarization service uh, within the Arcadia platform, reach out into Epic using our Smart on Fire app, acquire those new cancer data points, and merge that into a um, AI-generated uh, uh, care summary that can legitimately inform the, the, the course of care for oncology patients, for an oncology care coordinator, and I think that, that reduction in friction that we've been able to, to achieve with the standards and the work that this team has done uh, will accelerate the path of innovation, not just for Arcadia, but for everybody else. And I can't think of any better use case to accelerate innovation than, than that of cancer care. So a big up to, to, to Nick and Shafiq and the whole team here. All right. uh, I have to make a joke. So they made me sit between two Nicks. I'm changing my name to Nick. <laughs> All right. Hell of a joke. <laughs> well, data quality gurus here might, might have some question about that, okay? But I, I did want to invite Sagar and Moodley on the stage, uh, again, to just describe how they are implementing EOM models. Thank you. Thank you. Look, um, I, I don't know how many of you know who Antara is, but we're part of McKesson. And when we were called up, when, when the Biden moonshot program surfaced, it was, it was a no-brainer. Cancer's horrible. You know, when a, when a patient's told they have cancer, it's not just the patient, it's the entire family. The world goes dark. It's someone's mother, brother, son, daughter, sister, someone's loved one. It was just, it hit home. It was, you know, it's all about the passion we have. And so when this came, we said, look, we gotta do something about it. At Ontada, we part of McKesson, and so we have one of the largest U.S. oncology networks, over 25 years of practice management experience, 2,700 community oncologists across 31 states. And uh, this is where it happens, is how do you get care close to home so they don't have to go to an academic center, but they're really in the community, and healthcare is local, and we wanted care to be community-based and care to be community-centered. And so when this came up, we thought, how do we do this? How do we do it in the most effective way? And really uh, think about what it means to the person on the other end of this transaction. And so what you see here is a subset of EOM. EOM spreads five domains from uh, social determinants, and these are the clinical data elements to uh, demographics, and PHQ2, and PHQ9, and PHQ12, and NCC and the stress. But when it comes to this, it spreads f uh, six categories, and then seven cancers. When I talk to a community oncologist and I say, how many cancers do you see in a typical year? It's over 100. So while this is seven, we look forward to expanding this. When we thought about an oncology-ontology schema, 
very early on, we knew, because one of the things we do is we drive co community oncology tools and technology services to, to providers. And then we also make available this data to help uh, to, uh, to life science and biopharma for clinical trial, drug trial development. So we have this unique ability to move up and down this value chain. And so when we thought about it, we said, how do we bring all this data, everything about the patient, but remember, when someone sees an oncologist for cancer, that's just one fragment of the entire care continuum. And it's a very fractured, it's a very fragmented journey. And so we knew that if we bring that data into this ontology, we also knew that we needed to, and uh, you know, having had uh, some participation in DaVinci, having served as the chair, it was important to really solve this healthcare delivery. We couldn't expose what I call these 110 plugs, and every participant, whether it's payers, providers, uh, Epic, Cerno, Allscripts, NextGen, G, Athena, all the EMRs, all the payers, exposing the data that we need to fully understand what the patient was going through and bring that together in an aggregated view. But we also knew that a lot of data is in unstructured. And everything about the patient, and mind you, ambient listening, AI in the workflow, replacing scribes, is creating an accelerator for more unstructured blobs. And so we knew that we have to attack this problem with AI. And so we've built close to maybe 80, 80 90, and one may sit in here. She leads our AI work. And we built this AI engine to really go after unstructured data, pathology reports, or data of diagnosis, type of biopsy. A lot of data that we needed had to be mined in this unstructured blob. And so in fact, uh, around about August, we did an announcement with Microsoft because the REST API with ChatGPT didn't work for us. So we innovated with Microsoft to do a batch API to ChatGPT, so we created a batch endpoint with them and pushed through tens of millions of pathology reports and progress notes to really create all this data in this M code schema, which was great for us because now Moonshot arrives and we're like, no way, we write well, we positioned for this. And so if you go forward one slide, we took one of our community oncology practices, Compass in Oregon, and they were ready. We have 70% of our providers in our network are participating in EOM. So it was a no-brainer for us to say, hey, we already got the schema, we already got all the data, we're already doing a lot of the abstraction work that you would normally have to manually go and curate or ask a physician to populate we can fill the blanks combined with our EMR, Inomed, and then do this with, uh, and in fact, we're doing a trial motion study to show what the benefit is of AI as opposed to asking a lot of manual collection of the data. So we'll report back on that, and then maybe one last slide. Uh, this is a journey, you know, we, when we started our M code, we brought MITRE in to really look at our compliance of M code to EOM. And uh, we, were, we were close. We had a couple of missing pieces, but over the last six months, we're now at 100% compliance. So we are ready to rock and roll. And we look forward to everybody else leaning in. We really, really to need to leave healthcare in a better place than we found it. And cancer is one of the places we're passionate about. So we look forward to participating. Thank you, Sagarin. And a perfect segue to, to inviting James, who will talk about the M code standard, because ultimately standards will enable Nick to not have to write one off code on every vendor and every provider system. So, Nick, James, please go ahead and tell us about M code. Hi, I'm James Patterson from MITRE, um, and here to tell you a little bit about M code. Um, first, uh, hopefully, uh, folks are familiar, but if you're not, what is M code? Um, this is the development of the FHIR standard that has helped push forward how cancer data is transmitted. So to be able to talk about patient disease status, um, outcomes, which was a big one to add, and even genomics, there's, it covers a wide variety of things. It has kind of become the de facto standard, um, and it's got uh, buy-in kind of nationally and internationally at this point. Go ahead to the next slide. Oh yeah, Anish, Anish called on us again to run real short on this, so I'm gonna be very quick. <laughs> um, so M-Code Lite, though, uh, we introduced this a little while ago to be the starting point for how we are going to start implementing um, M-Code since it is such a large standard. So 
a um, little bit ago, we went through and did the evaluation of the EOM data elements. 15 of those line up with M code very nicely. So we helped develop uh, an initial implementation guide for that. Um, more recently though, several other uh, programs have decided that they're going to be based on other M code elements. So we're looking at how we can maximize that data utility across all of those programs. To help implement that though, we're looking at increasing the uh, flexibility or the, the coverage of M code just slightly to make sure that we cover kind of the nexus of all those different programs. And we're going to continue to roll that into uh, M code Lite um, to help make that implementation easier. And then the final announcement for today is that MITRE is going to be developing an Inferno test kit to be able to test conformance of M code Lite so that new implementers can go through and know if they're hitting the mark or not uh, moving forward. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, team answer. Let's, uh, we are definitely going to keep running the train. Yeah. And I'll so, be yes, we're going to swing back. Uh, thank you, Kathy. So we're going to ask Jonathan and, and Meg to come join us to guide us through the announcements the Secretary mentioned on the Interoperability Pledge earlier today. So Jonathan and Meg, come on up. Uh, they work for Secretary Elna Hall, and they bring this coalition to life. So thank you very much. Hi. So, whoa. The, um, <laughs> are you going to come up too? No. Okay. So the, uh, so we're going to be talking about two things today from Department of Veterans Affairs. It's really a pleasure to be here on this fast moving train. We, uh, the, uh, with the guidance of our undersecretary, Dr. Shreep el we've really been doubling down on interoperability. It's our job to make sure we're taking care of veterans both inside the VA and also outside the VA. We have two various type or two types of collaborations going on in these partnerships. One are for data quality and the other is the Veteran Interoperability Pledge. Briefly with the data quality initiatives, we're working with Levitt Partners and ONC and other parts of HHS to not only, uh, you know, there's been a lot of, we use Jim Georges from now from CDC's analogy. We've been talking a lot about the plumbing, how to get data to go back and forth with the APIs, but the water isn't fit to drink that's going through the plumbing. We can't do the types of calculations for data quality assessment, care quality assessment when we send patients out for care, and nor can we get the quality of data necessary for coordinating care across the institutional boundaries. So we're working with Level part Levitt Partners, a number of other healthcare systems and vendors to advance an agenda progressively for data quality over the next several years. Second, we're working with NCQA. They've been really great partners uh, with another co uh, coalition of many different types of people to improve uh, and so some of the, to improve the exchange of data and also the use of data. So again, part of that is not part of the 10 by 10 bulk fire demonstration, but we will be demonstrating some limited uh, bulk fire exchange and moving that forward. And then secondly, we'll be working on um, uh, the basics for clinical query language to make sure we can have consistent implementation with reliable reproduction of clinical query language. Now I'm gonna turn over to Meg Marshall, who's our director of, uh, of um, Re uh, informatic regulatory affairs and informatics, and she'll talk about a little bit more about the Veterans Interoperability Pledge. Thank you. Thanks. We intentionally didn't pull together slides for this. I think um, you're really going to be interested in hearing the stories from these wonderful health systems that um, have been part of our pilots around the Veteran Interoperability Pledge. But as mentioned by Dr. Elna Hall this morning, um, in I think it will be in two weeks, we will have launched exactly a year ago with our 13 health systems who came together with an agreement and um, a, a commitment toward working uh, to receive better coordination of care and um, coordination of benefits for, for veterans and who are shared patients within the community. Um, so he, I, Dr. Elna Hall mentioned earlier, we have three who are currently live. The next one will be moving forward quickly. Um, what you're about to hear is the technology that we moved forward with in phase one. Uh, it's really designed to get to the, the very foundational movement of um, can you identify a patient in front of you who is a veteran? 
Um, I'm very excited that we're getting ready to transition into phase two, which will build off of that technology and calling the, the VA's confirmation API and start doing some really smart things. So now that the provider knows that the patient in front of them is a veteran, what types of things can we do with that? And um, we're, we're finding that there's, in addition to the, the care coordination and the benefits coordination, the value to the veteran, um, just it's, it's uh, limitless actually. If you think about the, the veterans who are coming in in suicidal crisis who are not enrolled in, in VA, having conversations with them, giving them educational materials and the opportunity to enroll in VA and, and have access to some of those resources as well as resources in the community um, that could help lighten the financial load of, of our veterans who are getting cared for in the community. So I, I just said I wasn't gonna spend a ton of time, I feel like I already did, but excited. To, I, I would love for you to hear some of the data that these cell systems are pulling. Sorry. I'm back. Um, this initiative in particular is very personal to me. When I was 17, I enlisted in the United States Marine Corps. I served for five and a half years, three of that overseas. What I see now today is healthcare systems where pr veterans appear, present, and they may not be able or willing to communicate their veteran status. That causes a host of problems, but at the end of the day, to underscore what Meg, Jonathan, and the under undersecretary said, 22 a day. 22 veterans commit suicide a day in the United States, and that is unacceptable. We can do better. So in partnership, when we began this discussion, said let's solve this problem, we developed this solution in a matter of weeks. So this is not about technology. This is about prioritization of what matters to us in healthcare. And I'm thrilled now to say, in addition to, I'm so excited to hear what our partners at Stanford and Tufts uh, are able to share, but in addition, we will be releasing this and going to every customer in the United States, and my goal is to have this live in the next six months across the U.S. to help veterans. Thanks, Nick. Uh, my name is Jennifer Opitz, and I'm here this afternoon. Um, welcome to all of you. Here presenting with Dr. Roxana Lupu. I'm just going to discuss Sanford Health's partnership with the VA, with EPIC, as Nick alluded to, and why we agreed to join the pledge. Just wanted to share some statistics up here about our organization. Um, we are actually a very rural healthcare system. We have four primary markets. Um, we are located in the Dakotas both of them, uh, Minnesota and Iowa. And our strategic plan is to just ensure that Sanford Health becomes the premier rural health care system actually in the United States. That said, we are also continually developing and executing on strategies that position Sanford Health to become the destination of choice for veteran and our military personnel. We have a very long history of supporting veterans and current military members with programs that are designed, they're designed to meet their, their care needs. Some of those include a Sanford Veterans Club at all of our major medical centers, a veteran ambassador program, as well as a veteran hotline. This pledge and partnership is going to allow our teams to improve care for veterans by giving us seamless and immediate access to a patient's medical history which will help us make timely and accurate treatment decisions for them. This slide, uh, just wanted to say that earlier this year, we collaborated with EPIC, as Nick alluded to, to implement the Veteran Confirmation API. After very little time, but heads down work on this, and our commitment to the work, we were able to operationalize these efforts, and we began actively exchanging information with the VA back in May of this year. We spent the next several months then reviewing and perfecting workflows just to ensure that our veterans would have a positive patient experience within our organization. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Lupu, who's going to review the data that we've collected so far, as well as Sanford's next steps. Thanks, Jennifer. So you have some numbers here, and I'm not going to go uh, too much in details, but again, data is useless if you don't act on it. So we made uh, really easy for our providers and uh, frontline staffs to know that the patient that stays in front of them is a veteran. And our um, patient care access is uh, welcoming them, thanking them for this, their service, and also handing them a brochure, informing them of the benefits that they can apply to. Uh, 
so again, some numbers here. Uh, in a little bit over three months, we have 12,000 veterans uh, verified in our system. What's important here is about nine, uh, about 10% of them, they were not identified as veterans in the demographics. So this is a huge win. Again, about uh, 1,100 patients who now know they are veterans and we can extend uh, that help to them. Uh, uh, we also have about 50% of our uh, veterans suffering for, from one of uh, the preemptive conditions that it, you know, it was at least that was expanded in the uh, PACT Act. So we use this data to uh, dig uh, deeper and uh, we classified and uh, uh, wanted to see where we can uh, uh, focus these resources. So what conditions are more prevalent in our system? So as you can see here, one in three veterans is treated at Sanford for a malignant condition. So again, trying to um, uh, dedicate those resources uh, where we have the most concentration of veterans and uh, making sure that the care managers are uh, welcoming these patients and they are um, directing them to the resources that are appropriate for their care. And this is just an appetizer. We are from Midwest, so we are uh, really looking for the uh, ribeye steak here. So uh, we will definitely continue to collaborate with the VA. They have been a, a great partners, a partner in this journey, as, uh, as well as Epic, to uh, expand uh, on this interoperability and uh, make sure that we make it easier for our veterans to receive care. So. Uh, yeah, looking forward and really proud of uh, uh, our work. Hello, everybody. Um, Oracle is committed to serving our customers as well as our veterans. And so I'm pleased to announce today that Oracle will be offering this code free for all of our clients um, in support of the Veteran Pledge. Our clients will be able to download this code and using our implementation guide, we'll be able to implement this code themselves. Or should they opt to, they can employ the Oracle Health Consulting Services to implement the code with them. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. I am Jeannie Tishy. I am the Director of Interop and Integration Solutions at Marchfield Clinic Health System. And I'm just gonna give you a little background of our community care that we provide to our VAs, uh, VA uh, patients. Um, we are very rural, we cover a very rural area, and we know that we have about 12,000 folks that we have connected with through the referral process with the VA. Um, what we also know from data from the VA is we likely have um, 90 to 100,000 veterans in our service area that also are part of this system. So learning that we could do this confirmation API um, was a big deal for us. Uh, last year, we we're embarking on a research study to really assess what do veterans in our service area know about the benefits that they may have available to them? What kind of healthcare options do they have? And we soon realized that screening for this, trying to proactively reach out to all of our patients to really get a population understanding of what our vets knew um, was nearly impossible. We just don't have the resources to do that. Um, so um, in light of that, we put in place some manual work, uh, manual collection efforts at the point of registration, but of course you're only collecting that as people come in. So months can go by, years can go by before we're actually collecting that information. So um, we were delighted to be part of the interoperability pledge and actually get access to automate this. Um, so we embarked on that with Oracle Health. Um, and as of June 3rd, uh, we've been in, in pro progress for live for a little over th three months. And we focused on urgent care 
and emergent care type encounters, um, kind of the focus being on the Compact Act and um, we look at anybody who's coming in that's over 17 years of age um, and haven't already been confirmed um, through the API process and that ADT kicks off the um, initializing of calling that API. And as you can see by the numbers, we've identified a um, little over 1,800 veterans. And interesting enough, uh, there's some great data here by doing our manual collection efforts. We can see that it's very successful. You know, there might be some questions about whether you can really match on a patient, somebody who hasn't been in contact with a VA for years. Um, the fact that we can see 77% have self-reported that they're vets uh, is, is fantastic. And an additional 12% um, actually are vets, but they're not telling us that. So this really is a definitive um, confirmation about their vet status. We have a couple of other situations where maybe the patient isn't um, available, isn't conscious to answer the question, but um, we found it really interesting to see that uh, there are folks who who really aren't sharing that with us. And that gives us an opportunity to have careful communications um, with our vets, the outreach that we want to do. Um, and then with that, uh, it really makes a difference. Uh, now we are able to, just last week, we um, joined an initiative because we're very rural. Um, the VA has an initiative called VetCore. It's led by um, Dr. Carolyn Turvey out of Iowa. And it is providing us some funding and some ability to actually hire FTEs to move forward to doing that proactive outreach, creating that communication so that folks know maybe because they're standing in front of their neighbor um, and because we're very rural, everybody knows everybody, uh, that they're not comfortable sharing that or they feel like it's going to open up a lot of questions they're just not interested in answering today. So those communications are going to allow us to, in the privacy of their home, or perhaps their partner will take more note of saying maybe you should be connected. And we have evidence of big success stories, um, folks who never thought that they had a um, service-connected disability, or you can see the quote there, um, that they have changed their lives. They are getting benefits that they never knew that they could have, and it really changes, it's life-changing for them. They might have education benefits, um, things of that nature. So at Marshfield, we're really excited. We're just getting started. Probably the biggest issue is deciding what we're going to tackle first. So we have a, um, a retreat where we're going to prioritize look at our resources and um, tackle all of the information that we can use just because of this simple API. All right, thank you. Okay, I knew this would happen. Uh, I mean, I sure are spitballing. We have limited time, and so we're gonna do our best. We, we have to get out of this room or else we get in big trouble. So we have to do this. My friends in the Sync for Social Needs community, come on down. Now here's what we're gonna do. Uh, I'm going to ask my CMS friends to be on Audible, just in case we lose. So you got to chill. All right, we'll be on Audible. Okay, good. All right, let's get started with a little bit of demoing. Hi, I'm playing the role of a patient named George. I use Epic's MyChart app to manage my own health. I've got an upcoming appointment and have been asked to answer some questions ahead of time. That questionnaire could include what's bringing me in for a visit that day, but also importantly asks about social drivers of health. As you can imagine, some of these things can be challenging to discuss with my provider. So it's nice to be able to handle this in the app. After a recent job loss, I've been experiencing some financial strain, which is affecting my ability to pay for food and transportation. These responses will be immediately available for my care team. Changing roles, I'm now the nurse working in our primary care department and seeing George today. I can see the responses he filled out in the app and have access to social drivers previously assessed, even if it was at other health systems, through Care Everywhere, Epic's interoperability platform. This ensures we have a holistic view of each person. Based on George's identified needs and additional details like age, zip code, veteran status, and more, the system automatically queues up relevant resources. Looks like Cottage Grove Community Dining will be a great fit, so I send an electronic request letting them know about his interest in their food delivery program. I can also send this information to George directly in a text message. 
In addition, as a part of our commitment to the White House Challenge, at the end of this year, patients will be able to look up resources at any time directly in my chart. In addition to helping individual patients, Epic has the tools to analyze the impact we're making at the population level so we can monitor key trends over time. Let's do some deeper analysis to identify patients who have food insecurity and live in an area with a high social vulnerability index. Our GeoMap feature enables us to identify areas where we can reach the most vulnerable groups, promote health equity, and address community disparities. All right. What's the news, Nick? What you got? So two, two things. Uh, one, as a part of our commitment to the White House Challenge to End Hunger, we said that we would go to every Epic US customer and help to implement and operationalize food insecurity. Um, and help them to understand what their community links are going to look like, which is why I'm excited to hand off to my friends. Uh, we're about halfway done, so that's really exciting. So making a big impact in the ability to screen for food insecurity in the U.S. Second, a number of the data elements that help with this work live in HTI-1, which is required by 1-1-2026 by regulation. We shipped it last month, and we're working on USCDI v4 so that we stay ahead of the curve to help our customers and solve problems like this. Yay! And we'll keep the path going speedy. I'm Joffrey Trace uh, with Find Help. Um, we work with about 130 of the Epic Hospital systems, so thank you, Nick. Um, this is just showing that through fire observations, we're able to actually bring in uh, those positive screens, um, bring them into a system that can then automate uh, understanding what the needs are of an individual, uh, turn those into discrete recommendations that are both distance and coverage based for that individual, saving many of the clinicians and staff a lot of time to, to generate those recommendations and bring in much of this discrete data from the electronic health record. And then also turn it into a codified list uh, of uh, observations or screens, which then help for public health and reporting. Um, New York, of course, has a big waiver that was just released, uh, and they have their own implementation guide, uh, for better or for worse, but it aligns with the opportunity of identifying a condition or an individual that has a positive screen. Um, now, there is a code for that, for food insecurity. I think the debate uh, in the clinical community will need to be um, what really designates an individual as having food insecurity. Is it just a positive screen, or is there some interaction with the individual to truly identify that this person has that specific need? Next slide. Uh, that takes us to eligibility. So many of the modern systems for social care now are able to ingest whether or not somebody is actually, for example, a Medicaid recipient. And that's really important now to identify what additional benefits somebody will qualify for. So on the right here for number two, maybe there's a reimbursable program like with CalAIM and the 1115 waiver or New York and their waiver. Um, perhaps we can also identify what supplemental benefits or value-added benefits uh, an individual uh, qualifies for as well. But today, it's not discreet to do that particular query, and that's a big opportunity for us to make a new commitment to push uh, those that offer these types of benefits, both supplemental and value-added, to be able to publish those lists in a standardized way that our health systems and, and provider friends can directly query those benefits and automate the process of recommending the potential coverage. Next slide. And last but not least, uh, many payers are making these available more discreetly now, and so we have a unique opportunity to turn those into queryable uh, resources. Um, on the bottom, CMS has said in their own words, they expect better tracking of the utilization of these services and better transparency uh, regarding the re reporting and uptake of these services. So I think we're in a great position now uh, to really require easier uh, adoption of these benefits. All Thanks, right. Nisha. Thank you, Jeffer. Meredith. Bring us home. Hi, everyone. Meredith Little, Medicaid Strategic Director with Unite Us. Um, would be remiss if I didn't mention, last time I was here was 2018 when I worked for CMS. And so much of the work that the agency has done in healthcare around fire APIs has given us a seat at the table. And so really, really excited to be here today um, on behalf of Unite Us. Um, so the first slide, so I won't spend much time on this because I think Jaffer and Nick did a great job, but this really is how we think of the standard today where we are, uh, we've all been brought to the table and ensure that healthcare and social care are speaking the same language, working together. And there's been so much work uh, by Sync for Social Care with Anish and the Gravity Project to make sure that we're exchanging data in a way that's meaningful for one another and I really applaud that work. 
And I want to spend a little more time on the next, uh, the next screen here. And this is really where we think about taking things a step further and going from that screening ingestion, making it really easy for providers to participate in this work, to then make a referral recommendation that's automated, and then to what's really important is ensure there is the capacity for these organizations that we're sending patients to to be able to serve. And that's by automating a invoice or a claim so that Individuals at a food pantry aren't manually entering LOINC codes, ICD-10 codes, Z codes. That's all done on the back end of the technology, making sure that the community is at the forefront when we're thinking about standards, when we're thinking about innovating with fire APIs, whatever the, the newest technology is, that there is an individual at the end. And just like when we were starting in this space in healthcare, and we talk about patients over paperwork, we talk about administrative burden, Think of your churches, think of your food pantries, think of your small local uh, taxi family owned company who are trying to get reimbursed for these services to ensure that they can grow and have the capacity to serve the individuals um, who are in need. And so um, this really, this works, it's enabled us to facilitate over $100 million back into the community under North Carolina's Healthy Opportunities 1115 waiver. In New York, we will be working with the lead social care networks representing nearly 75% of Medicaid lives. And we are so excited to announce that we're gonna be building a digital front door, which means that no, no matter where a patient is screened, that we're gonna be able to ingest those screenings into Unite Us to ensure that action is able to be taken to connect those individuals to, to services. And so quickly, what's next? Just thinking about the stakeholders in this room that represent a lot of different sectors that we keep the community at the forefront when we are, as I said, developing technology innovation, when we're developing standards, because in the end, the, the data in is the data out. And so we want to make it as easy as possible and appreciate the opportunity. Thanks, Anish. All right, thank you. 30 seconds. Andrea, you want to do it? Just go, let's go. 30, 30, 30. CMS, CMS, CMS. You want to do a quick shout out? Do a shout out. Hi, everyone. I don't know if you've heard about the AI, um, but AI is here, I would say. Um, and at CMS this past week or so, we launched a request for information, an RFI, for AI demo days. So we're looking for people to come show us their super cool technology. You can just Google it. We had a QR code. Um, so please go ahead and Send us your responses and come and demo. We're kicking open the government doors so people can show us their cool technology. If you know of stuff that we should see, please tell people to apply. I'm going to give Remy the last 10 seconds. Yep, you can email cmsdemodays at cms.hhs.gov for more information on that. Uh, we just launched our open source program office and our website. You can email opensource at cms.hhs.gov if you have questions about that. And we just launched a vulnerability disclosure program with CISA.gov to help do security audits on Medicare, Medicaid, and other websites. So bugcrowd.com slash CMS dash VDP for more info. Back to you, Anish. Thank you, everybody, for all the great work. We did it. Okay, thank you all.